Thank you, Greg. It's uh, so nice. I would, I would love to say that when I arrived, I got a warm welcome, but it was not warm at all. <laughs> and I live in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado at uh, 8,350 feet or 2,550 meters, for those of you who don't have gray hair. Um, <laughs> Well, I always tell everybody that in America, we went on the metric system the same exact time that you did, and at least seven of us have now learned it. <laughs> so anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. This is my final lecture at this, uh, uh, my first time here in Calgary and Alberta. Uh, I'm thrilled to be a part of the Vancouver Shroud Association. I'm actually on their board of directors. Uh, when you go out there, thank Carolyn, who has done just this amazing job. She pretty much single-handedly administers this exhibit, organizes it, uh, books it to different parishes around Canada over uh, uh, the Lenten seasons every year. And this particular exhibit, the 21 days that it's been here, is the longest in the history of the Man of the Shroud exhibit. And the second time that this exhibit has been here at this parish. So this parish is pretty special in the eyes of the VSA and, of course, those of us who are involved with it. At any rate, tonight I'm going to be giving you a little bit of information about the Shroud of Turin. Hopefully I will keep you awake for a while. I'll do my best. And I want you to know that I start my lectures the same way every time. So if you've seen me talk before, you've probably heard my opening line. Um, and that is that before I'm finished tonight, you'll know exactly why a nice Jewish guy like me is involved with the most important relic of Christianity. And at the very end of the talk, I will give you the answer to that if you hadn't figured it out by the time I get there. <clears throat> now, the, typically the first question I get is how did you get involved with this? And that's a really good question. I asked myself that a lot of times in the early days of my involvement. Uh, but ultimately, I'm just going to tell you now so that if there is time for Q&A at the end of this, we don't, I don't have to explain it then. And that's really simple. I'm a professional photographer, retired now, but back in the 70s, I operated a photographic studio, a commercial studio in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, I didn't do portraits and weddings, but I did work for aerospace companies, Hughes and uh, GM Delco and Raytheon and people like that. And I also did scientific and uh, medical work for some of the largest medical device companies in the world. And so I received a call one day from a gentleman named Don Devan. And you don't have to write it down. There's no quiz at the end. But uh, Don Devan uh, represented a company called Information Sciences. He was an imaging scientist. And he called me up and he said, look, we're doing a project for Los Alamos National Laboratories, and we need a photographic consultant. So I said, oh, sure, you know, when you're self-employed, you take the jobs when the phone rings. And so I took the job, and for seven months, we worked on a project about atomic bombs. And, you know, uh, typically when you go to a company that manufactures something, you go into their lobby, there's these great photographs of whatever their product might be. But, of course, they couldn't put pictures of atomic bombs on the wall of Los Alamos because they were classified. And so they had the next best thing, they were aerial photographs of the big depression caused by the underground nuclear tests that they had performed over the years. So, and I'd love to tell you more about the project, but as I said, it was classified, and if I tell you any more, I have to kill you, and there's too many of you, so just leave it at that. So for seven months, I did this project uh, on atomic bombs. At the end of that project, we finished, uh, went back to my office, and I thought, well, that's it. And the phone rang, and it was the same man again just a week or two later. And I thought, aha, another project. And he said, well, not exactly. He said, what do you know about the Shroud of Turin? And I kind of laughed, and I said, but Don, I'm Jewish. And Don laughed, and he said, so am I, remember? Don was one of the other Jewish members of our team. And so I said, well, I don't know anything about the Shroud other than it's probably a fake. And Don said, well, look, a couple of scientists at Los Alamos National Labs have taken a photograph that was made in 1931, the same photograph, by the way, that this replica was made from. And he said, they've taken this photograph and they put it into a device called a VP8 image analyzer. And basically all it does is a black and white video camera, you input an image to this device, and the output is on a green screen display, kind of like a big oscilloscope monitor. 
And what it does is it took the lights and darks of the image and stretches them into vertical 3D space, proportion them to each other. So that typically you put a photo in there and you get this jumbled mass of shapes, it makes no sense at all. But he explained to me that when they put an image of the shroud in there, it yielded the natural relief of a human form. Well, when I heard that, and of course he said it in more technical terms, he said that there seems to be a correlation between image density and cloth to body distance. Okay, well, that's why I didn't say that first, because I don't want you, I want you to go to sleep just yet. Anyway, um, when he said that to me, of course I understood that from a technical point of view, and I said, well, you know, there's no way that we photographers can encode depth, spatial, or 3D topographic information into a normal photograph. There's no way, it's a two-dimensional image that we're making. The only thing that we photographers can do is to imply depth is to use highlighting and shadows to sort of give the impression of depth, but it's still two-dimensional. There's no three-dimensional or distance information encoded. So that got my interest, but I was raised in an Orthodox Jewish home and I really didn't feel comfortable. So he said, look, these guys are putting together a team. They're gonna want, to... I told them that I just finished working with you. They said, we're gonna need a photographer. He said, so would you like to be a part of this? And I said, no, I didn't wanna get involved with this. And he said, well, look, before you make a decision, let me bring you some literature on the shroud. So I said, well, all right, fair enough. So he, uh, now in the United States at the time, starting in the 1950s actually, four priests had uh, created an organization called the Holy Shroud Guild. And their job was primarily to promote the Shroud of Turin in the United States. Well, he brought me the, all this literature, it was about a foot high, sorry I'm not using metrics here, um, it's about a foot high. And they were all religious tracts from the Holy Shroud Guild. Didn't help a bit. If anything, it just confirmed that, nah, I don't think I want to get involved with this. But that image property sort of stuck in the back of my head, and I said, okay, I guess maybe I'll do this. But you know what I was really thinking? Free trip to Italy. <laughs> yeah, that was the amount of depth I had on this topic back then. Of course, I was a bit younger then, 40 years younger to be precise. Actually, more than that, because that conversation took place in 1976, so that's actually 42 years ago that when uh, God sort of dragged me kicking and screaming onto this team. And so I went ahead and I joined the team. Well, interestingly enough, a few, but maybe a few weeks or a month later, as the team continued to grow, and, and nobody made a list and started calling people's names. They, somebody said, like my friend Don, they said, we're gonna need a photographer. He said, well, I know this Barry Schwartz guy, let's call him. They said, we need a chemist. Somebody said, I know this chemist at Los Alamos, Ray Rogers. And so we needed some really high-end high image specialists. And somebody called a, two gentlemen from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA's JPL in Pasadena, California. And, those, and two of those gentlemen joined our team. One of them, another man named Don, just to confuse you even more, Don Lynn, may he rest in peace. And, when he joined the team, he and I hit it off. I mean, look, he's a NASA imaging scientist who is in charge of imaging on Voyager and Viking and Mariner and Galileo. Not just anybody, but a really top-notch imaging scientist. So he immediately became my hero on the team. And, uh, you know, technical photographer, NASA imaging scientist, uh, doesn't get much better than that. And so he and I hit it off very quickly. And I remember saying to him one day, because I was starting to feel maybe I shouldn't be doing this, also, I was being surrounded by all these brilliant scientists, and I'm just an old hippie photographer. Well, I was a young hippie photographer then, but... And, and so I remember saying to Don one day, well, gee, Don, what's a nice Jewish boy like me doing on this team? And he looked at me, and he said, well, apparently you've forgotten that the man in question's a Jew. And I said, no, I, I didn't know a lot about Jesus, but I knew he was a Jew. I was raised in a neighborhood that was half Italian and half Jewish, so, you know, I knew a little bit about Jesus. And he says, oh, so you don't think God would want one of his chosen people on our team? Well, then I laughed and I said, no, I never thought that. And then he gave me perhaps the greatest advice I've ever been given. He said, you know, Barry, you should shut up, stop complaining, go to Turin, do the very best job you can do because God doesn't tell us in advance what the plan is, but one day you'll know. 
<clears throat> those are the words that kept me on that team for the rest of the, until now, effectively. And, and looking back on that years afterwards, I realize now that that was God speaking to me through my friend's voice. God had a purpose for me on that team, and I wasn't ready to know that purpose yet. Matter of fact, it took almost 20 years before it was finally revealed to me, and I'll tell you that part of the story when we get there. So anyway, but that's how I got onto this team. So it was sort of kind of kicking and screaming and wanting to quit, uh, but I stayed on, and of course, I'm forever grateful my life has been enriched a thousandfold because I've stayed and did this and continued to do this until God finally did reveal the real purpose of my being here, and we'll talk about that as we go through the talk tonight. So what I'm going to do this evening is, first thing I'm going to do is give you sort of an introduction to the shroud. I'm not going to go into a lot of technical or scientific details tonight because I really don't want to put you to sleep. And it's really easy if you get too technical to put even people who have great interest in the subject to sleep. So we're going to avoid that. What I do want to do, though, is give you this kind of an overview of the shroud and what's on there in case you're not really familiar with it. And then beyond that, I'm going to take you behind the scenes of what we did in 1978. Because whenever we hear the term scientific research project, you immediately think, you know, laboratory, stainless steel, and enamel, and all these and you'll see that it wasn't like that at all. And so, uh, and then after the, uh, after I show you what we did in 78 and sort of give you our results, then I'm gonna address the one piece of science that points against the authenticity of the shroud. Most of you already know what I'm talking about and that's the radiocarbon dating. And so that is a, an essential part of this talk because I'm sure that many of you either know people or maybe even yourself have thought that that radiocarbon dating said the shroud was a fake. Well, technically, radiocarbon dating can't say something is a fake. So that in itself is kind of a bad, gave the shroud a bad rap. But we're going to talk about that as we go. I just want you to understand one thing before I begin. The purpose of our team going to Turin was not to prove this is Jesus, because there's no way scientifically we can do that nor to prove the resurrection, because I always felt that the resurrection's not a test for science, but a test of faith. And I bet your father would agree with me on that one. Yeah, father's right back there. <laughs> anyway, so what we're gonna do is I'm going to start by giving you that overview and then we'll get rolling. So if, let us try to begin. So the first thing we see is the image on the Shroud of Turin and it's very subtle and there's all these other distracting things running along the length of it. Now, I want to point something out to you. The replica that I'm standing in front of has been enhanced, the contrast has been increased because it's designed to help you better see what's on the shroud. Because if you look at my photograph up here, you'll see that the image is a lot more subtle than what you're seeing on the replica behind me. And that's because you know, the image on the shroud's only 15 or so percentage points darker than the background. So it's not a very contrast, uh, Im contrasty image. And of course, the first thing we notice about the shroud are the weird dimensions. Now, of course, I've got it up there in feet, so some of you are good with that. But the dimensions are still strange. I mean, 14 and a half by three and a half feet that's really bizarre, and, and it doesn't make a lot of sense by the measure, units of measure that we use today, but back in the first century, they used a unit of measure called the cubit. So when I started doing a little research on the cubit so that I could speak with some authority on the subject, I found that there were at least 30 different measurements called the cubit, so that wasn't very helpful. So I started looking at all these different measurements called the cubit and discovered that there was one the Syrian cubit, that if you take these dimensions and compare it to the Syrian cubit, it would be eight by two precisely. Now that's a good indication, in all likelihood, this piece of cloth was probably made in Syria. Now we know from the Gospels that it was brought by Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man, they don't tell us much else, I believe he's one of the Sanhedrin, and he could afford to have a finely woven cloth because in the Old Testament, it says someone of high stature must be buried in pure, clean linen raiments, okay? 
And that pure means no mixing of cotton or wool with the linen. It's called mixing of the kinds, and it's forbidden for a burial shroud of someone of high stature. So we know it was provided by Joseph of Arimathea. It was, they didn't make this kind of cloth in the Jerusalem area, so inevitably it was imported, making it more expensive. And although Syria is really not that far away from Jerusalem by today's standards, in the first century, people often didn't travel more than a kilometer or two from where they were born in their whole lives. So this would have probably come in on the back of a camel in a caravan and would have been purchased by Joseph of Arimathea. And by the way, in some of the versions of the gospel that I've seen, it says that he bought it and implied that he bought it that day, uh, the day of the crucifixion. Probably not, because by the time he would have gotten around to buying it, the Jewish stores would have been closed in preparation of the Sabbath. So he already had a tomb, so it's quite likely he already had the cloth. Sure, he bought it at some point. It doesn't say when in the Gospels anyway, but he would have probably had it and then got it. Remember, they used his tomb to put Jesus in as well. So that's why these dimensions that started off being kind of strange make a little more sense now when we look at that. Now, continuing on, how do you get an image on a cloth of the entire front and the entire back of a man head to head the way we see it on the shroud? Well, this beautiful old Della Rivera painting explains it quite nicely. His feet were at one end. I'll point them out on both. His head in the center, cloth wrapped over and back to his feet. Now, also in the Gospels, it mentions linen strips. Now, why would we need linen strips? Because if you wrap a body this way and go to move it, it's just going to fall off. So they used the linen strips that were mentioned in the Gospels to bind the body into the shroud. They did not wrap the body like a mummy. By the first century, even the Egyptians had stopped doing that. But I just had an email today from a lady and she told me, oh, the shrouds are fake because, uh, you know, because it, he was wrapped in strips. No, the Jews have never done that. It's always been a full burial shroud. And when my father passed away in 2003, he had an Orthodox Jewish burial and he was in a shroud. So even to this day, that's followed particularly by the Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox. Uh, not all Jews follow that, but you know, not all Catholics follow all the rules either, is what can I say? <laughs> Oops, that's why Father's here for confession later on. <laughs> anyway, so this is how it would have been wrapped. Now look, nobody knew much about the Shroud of Turin until 1898 when this gentleman was permitted to make the first photographs of the Shroud using that little camera on the right. And a little later here, you'll see a photo of me standing next to it to get a sense of just how little the camera is. Well, when Secundo Pia made this photograph, of course, in those days, he had to use this large camera. He had to have big glass plates. He had to climb up on a scaffolding with this camera. He had to deal with the fluctuating voltage in the royal palace that flickered and made his first set of exposures incorrect. He had to do it a second time. But when Secundo Pia made his photos, when he looked through his camera, and you know, this is one of those cameras that has a big ground glass on the back, and that's what you focus your image onto. You have that dark cloth over your head. You've all seen that at least. And his eyes would have seen this, natural color image of the shroud, but there was no color film in 1898. And speaking of film, I need to mention that I was speaking to a young uh, group of 10-year-olds in BC a couple of years ago, and I mentioned film, and a 10-year-old put up his hand. He said, excuse me, Mr. Schwartz, you keep talking about film. Is that a USB device? <laughs> oh, that just shows you how things have changed over the last few decades. Anyway, this is what his eyes would have seen, but this is what his film recorded. And when he saw that, he realized something. He realized that if you look at the natural color image of the shroud, that image has its lights and darks reversed, like a photo negative. And so when he took his photograph onto his glass negative plate, it inverted those lights and darks to this, and all of a sudden, this looks far more natural and realistic than the natural color image does without the inversion. And so he realized that What's on the shroud has one property like a photographic negative, and that is the lights and darks are inverted. So remember that back in, especially in 1978, 
there were a lot of skeptics who said, well, it's just a painting. Well, it's just made by some medieval forger. Really? Well, this medieval forger had to be pretty clever because the first thing he would have had to do was invent photography. And it just so happens that the very first photographic negative ever made was made in 1826 by a man named Nietzsche for Nietzsche. Don't make notes, no test. Uh, but Nietzsche for Nietzsche made the first negative, and we still have it. We still have his glass plate. So uh, when Secundo Pia claimed that the image on the shroud had a property like a photo negative, he was immediately accused of fraud. And it wasn't until 33 years later in 1931 when the second photographs were authorized, from which, by the way, this replica here was made, that the same properties were found. They, it didn't change. And so he was vindicated, but it took all those years before the second set of photographs allowed, ultimately showed that Secundo Pia was correct. So Secundo Pia made this photo, and you know, let's look at what's on the shroud, but let's make it easier for you because I already see some of you twisting your necks. <laughs> I want you to have a stiff neck by the time you leave. So let's take the image, let's take half of the shroud at a time, and let's stand the man before us, and let's look from the top down exactly what we see. Now, the first thing we see at the top of the head are blood stains that cover the scalp. When I say cover the scalp, we're not talking about a little cir circular, uh, like a laurel wreath kind of image. And that's exactly why so many depictions of Jesus wearing the crown of thorns show him with this beautiful little woven wreath. Well, guess what, folks? They didn't tell the Roman soldier that this criminal you're about to execute, before you do that, weave him a pretty crown, let's make him look good. Of course that didn't happen. They just took a nasty thorn bush and smashed it down on his head. Now why do we have this circular motif running throughout all these art his history of Christian art? It's real simple. In the first century when artists depicted Roman emperors or people of high stature, they always put a laurel wreath around their head. So the artist took that motif and when they wanted to depict Jesus, they just exchanged the laurel wreath for thorns. And that's why we get this circular motif. It's artistic license, but it's not accurate. And speaking of artistic license, how often in Christian art do you see a depiction of Jesus naked? You don't. Because artists had artistic license, it would have been horribly inappropriate to show a fully naked Jesus, especially back in medieval times and even to, to this day. So they always included a modesty cloth. That's artistic license. Same thing that Mel Gibson used when he made the film The Passion. He showed Jesus being scourged with hooks called scorpioni, and the, the Romans had them. They used them. But when they used scorpioni on you folks, you didn't survive to get to the cross. That was capital punishment in its own right. But Mel understood that sitting in a darkened theater, watching this, he wanted you to feel the horror of the moment. So he took it to the extreme. He didn't care that it wasn't historically accurate. His concern was to make you feel that emotion that he was trying to capture on a, on a piece of film. At any rate, continuing down, look at the face and you can see both cheekbones, one more swollen than the other, both of them swollen. You can see the nose, the mustache, the beard. Notice the beard has kind of a notch of an inverted V. Well, if you look in the prophecies, it says they will pluck his beard. Well, it looks like a chunk of his beard has been ripped out. Now, I have some friends, uh, I must admit they're Protestant friends, and they tell me the shroud's a fake because it says in the prophecies they would pluck his beard. And this guy's got a beard, so he can't, this can't be Jesus. And I also point, so I have to point out to them, it doesn't say they gave him a shave. And if you look in the Old Testament, you'll see Jews are forbidden to trim their beards and their hair, okay? And consequently, if it says in the prophecies that they would pluck his beard, that implies he had a beard. You can't pluck it if there's no beard. So these are one of the things that I kind of preach to my Protestant and evangelical friends that they're misinterpreting their own gospels, which really bugs them coming from a Jew, I'm afraid. But, uh, but so be it, such is life. Anyway, continuing on. Oh, here's another thing. Remember that our intent was to go there and determine how the image was formed. And we had all these skeptics telling us it was a fake, it was a forgery, it was done by some medieval guy. 
Now, we've all seen depictions of Jesus being scourged, haven't we? There's lots of them out there in art history, Christian art history. They always show the scourge marks on his back, don't they? That's correct, except for one thing. In reality, if I'm standing behind somebody and I'm whipping them, all I have to do is just lean forward a little bit and whip them, and those thongs are going to come around. They're going to hit the front of the body as well. Well, guess what? If you look closely on the shroud, you'll see scourge marks on his chest, on his thighs, on his knee, but below his knees. He has scourge marks on the front of his body. No artist has ever done that. And this is another piece of evidence that this isn't an artwork. It's far too accurate. Art, artists have artistic license. They can do what they want, but they aren't forensic experts either. And that's what it would take to get this 100% correct. So we have that. Now, I'm going to point out that under the chin is that little diagonal line. You see that? That's a crease because for centuries they would roll the shroud up on a dowel and put it in the wooden reliquary box and put it away. Well, that's gotten pressed in so much, and ladies, you know this especially, you do that over centuries, that's going to be very hard to get out. That's pressed in almost permanently. But here's the irony. There, uh, when you look back at some of the artworks that were produced during the, uh, from the uh, uh, Eastern Church, uh, the uh, iconography of the Eastern Church, there are many depictions of Jesus. They all seem to look like the man of the shroud, and some of them have a diagonal line incorporated into the artistic motif that the artist put there. Now, where do you think they got that idea? Well, maybe, maybe they just saw this piece of cloth and the image it bears, and so that's a good clue. And by the way, there's also some coins. I think it's a Justinian coin. And you can see the diagonal line that the engraver that made the coin incorporated into the design. So that's a pretty good clue that throughout art history, artists have based their depiction of Jesus on the image on the shroud. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's not an accident that these things happen. All right, continuing on. We have the spear wound in the side. Now, let me point that out. You can see it here. I'll point it on both sides. There it is, with a blood flow. Now, remember this great medieval forger, this brilliant forger who invented photography? Well, to make an accurate shroud as accurate as the Shroud of Turin, he also had to discover gravity. Because if you look at that spear wound here, now you notice that fire damage on either side. And by the way, these triangular things are patches sewn in. Uh, two years after the fire by the poor Claire sisters to reinforce the cloth where it had been burnt through. So some of the shroud there was destroyed. So what we don't see is the spear wound blood flow flowing down his sides and pooling at the small of his back. And I'll show that to you in a moment, but I can show it to you right here. Now, do you think a medieval forger would have thought of that? Of course not. Because now this guy who invented photography 600 years actually before the invention of photography also would have dis had to discover gravity. And I don't think that happened. And yet we have this natural blood, flow of blood pulling at the small of the back. Now, continuing on, we have blood stains coming down the arms. Most people believe that from the crucifixion position, the blood flowed down his arm, and that's what we're seeing. And then we have the blood stain at the back of the hand. Remember, we're only seeing the back of the hand. We're not seeing the entry wound of the nail. We're seeing the exit wound. And this has been a big uh, debate within the shroud world amongst the forensic pathologists. But here's the thing. I'm a practical kind of guy. And I'm thinking, okay, so I'm a Roman soldier, and I happen to be the lowest guy on the totem pole, so I get to do the dirty job of having to nail this man to a cross. Well, I want to make it as easy on myself as I can. And here's the thing. You know, most artworks depict a nail right in the center of the palm. We've all seen that. I would say the majority of Christian art always depicts it. But here's the thing. If you're a strong person, you know, there's not a lot there. And if you're a strong person under great duress, you might be able to rip your hand loose. Well, the Romans didn't want that to happen. So they knew that they could go down just a little bit below that center and nail you so you could never lift your hand loose. And you can try it yourself. Take your thumb and your little finger, put them together, and then look in your palm. Notice you have two fleshy parts of your palm with a groove running up the middle. It's called the thinner furrow. 
Now, if you're a Roman soldier and you got to nail this man to a cross, you grab the hand like that, you put the nail right between those two fleshy parts of the palm. Take a look, it's about an inch below the center of the palm. Still in the hand, so it doesn't go against anything it says in the Gospels. But the exit wound would come out precisely where we see it here on the shroud. So again, more forensically accurate than any artistic depiction ever made. We also have a patch. Now, I want to point out to you a couple of things, especially this. This is a water stain. This is a water stain. You know, in 1532, when the, it was in a fire, they didn't have fire extinguishers, so they had to dump water onto it. And, you know, water spreads out by capillarity through a piece of cloth, carrying with it all the particulates and dust and dirt and debris that might be there at the microscopic level, plus any minerals that might be in the water. And they all went, wind up in the periphery of that water stain, making it not only visible to our eyes, but even on the x-rays that were taken of the shroud, those water stains showed up. And ironically, again today, somebody sh uh, sent me a link to a video where some, pardon me for saying this, some idiot, saw this water stain above the head and said, oh, this isn't Jesus, this is, this is the devil, this is the Antichrist, this is, that man has horns. <laughs> horns? No, I'm not kidding. I, I mean, there's a video on YouTube that they sent me the link to, and I watched about three minutes, and I had to stop. I, this guy's an idiot. That's a water stain. Now, worse than that, some people have thought that that's the back of the head. Well, if that were true, and this were his front of his head, and that's the back of his head, guess what, folks? He'd be paper thin. That's a mistake, too. It's a water stain, and the space between the front and the back, ventral and dorsal images, is about the right amount, if you know what you're looking at. But people just take a quick look, think they've solved the mystery, and move on. So in this case, that, those water stains are significant. Now, continuing on here, um, we have more scorches, and we have blood stains at the feet. Now, historically, most artworks, again, have depicted Jesus with three nails, one in each hand, one for both feet. Well, you know, that's nice. That really works well with the Trinity, if you're Catholic. Unfortunately, the only remains of a crucifixion victim ever found was a man named Jehohanan, found in, I believe, 1963. And he had the crucifixion nail still in his ankle bone through the side of his ankle, the implication being that one foot was nailed on one side of the stipes and one on the other. That's the vertical part of the cross called the stipes. Well, the big problem was, you know, these nails were a precious commodity in the first century. So the Romans would pull them out and reuse them once the body was hanging up there long enough that they would take the body down, and I'm sorry to say this, throw it into a pit where the jackals and dogs would eat it, and they reused the nails. Well, apparently in the case of Jehohanan, when they were nailing him, the tip of the nail hit a knot in the wood and bent. They couldn't get it out, so they buried him with that nail in his ankle, and so we have that still to this day, and that makes me believe that probably they used four nails on Jesus. But guess what? We cannot tell from the shroud precisely whether it was three or four, so, you know, the shroud can't answer that question for, to a certainty. Let's look at the dorsal view. Looking again at the head, blood stains covering the scalp, not just in a pretty little circlet. We have scourge marks on the back, and of course, that's something we would expect now to see on the back of the body, on the dorsal view. And look at those blood stains. I already showed them to you a moment ago on the replica. There's the blood flow from the spear wound flowing down his side and pulling at the small of his back. Well, guess what? That, again, far more forensically accurate than anything, any artwork ever done. And then we have these burn holes. Now, I'm going to point them out to you, kind of an inverted L shape. Keep those in mind for later on because they become more significant. Here's why. First of all, those L-shaped burn holes were not put there during the 1532 fire. They predate that fire, and we don't know how far back or when or what the event was that where those L-shaped burn holes occurred. So keep them in mind, because a little later on we're going to talk about them, 
and the significance. We know they predate the fire because an artwork was commissioned by the owners of the Shroud, the Savoy family, uh, in 1516, 16 years before the fire, and that artwork depicts the man of the shroud, naked, arms crossed, with a modesty cloth, by the way, and those L-shaped burn holes. They would have been the darkest and most obvious things on that cloth. You'd have noticed those dark L-shaped burn holes a lot quicker than you would have noticed the subtle image between them. So they'll be significant a little later on. Going further down, we have the scourge marks, and if you'll notice, those scourge marks go all the way down to his feet, to his ankles. That tells us that they literally beat him from head to toe. That's a terrible thing. And it's when it comes to those nails, when people start arguing about how many nails were used, I say, does it really make a difference? Who cares how many nails they used? Look what they did to him. You know, I haven't said this since I've been here, but I'm going to say it now. Set aside the theology, the religiosity, and all those things. Put those aside for a minute. Just as a human being, when you see what this man suffered for something he believed in, how can you not admire and love him, forgetting the religious part, just as a human being for what he suffered, for what he believed? And remember who I am when I'm telling you this. This was one of our boys. So, continuing on, we get to the feet. Now we see a bloody footprint, and that tells us something else. That tells us that that knee, where the foot is on, because you can try this when you go home. Lay on your back and try and get your foot flat without bending your knee. Can't do it unless somebody snaps your ankle. And of course, that wasn't the case. No broken bones on the man of the shroud, which, by the way, is consistent with the Old Testament prophecies, that no bones would be broken. Anyway, we have a bloody footprint telling us that this leg, that knee is bent. And on this leg, we're looking only at the back of the ankle. The toes would be pointing away from us. So you can see that it would be really difficult to say to a scientific certainty how many nails were used. So with that in mind, those are the primary, most important things to look at. There are a lot more subtle details we could talk about, but you really don't want to be here for four hours. Neither do I, frankly, okay? So I'm on your side on that one. Okay, here's a close-up of the scourge wounds, and if you look at them, you'll see this distinctive dumbbell shape. You can see it here, kind of two circles joined by a little line. You can see that on many of them, and that's because this is what a Roman flagrum looks like. And we know that for a fact because they have found some of these lead weights when they ex uh, excavated Herculaneum near Pompeii. They actually found some of these lead weights. Now, on our team was Dr. Robert Bucklin, a world-renowned a uh, forensic pathologist, and especially those of us with gray hair remember a television show called Quincy. It was based on Dr. Robert Bucklin, and he was the advisor to the program. He was on our team. We didn't mess around. We had really top-notch people. That's why, believe it or not, with as much as I talk, I was very quiet in those days, surrounded by all these top-notch scientists from Los Alamos and Sandy and Jet Propulsion Lab, all these brilliant people. And, you know, my mother used to tell me, if you're in a room with smart people, keep your mouth shut, you might learn something. So for years I did. Anyway, that's what a Roman flagrum looks like. Now, I mentioned earlier that our team was sort of formed up because a couple of scientists put an image into this device, the VP8 image analyzer. Now, ironically, I always tell everybody this looks like an old stereo tuner. I did not tell that to the kids I spoke to this morning in second and sixth grade because it would go right over their head. They wouldn't know what a stereo tuner is, but it does kind of look like a stereo tuner for those of us old enough to remember them. And this is the device, and this is, let's see, come on, there you go, it's working. Now, we took a photograph, or they took a photograph, I was not present when this occurred, and if you look at it, you'll see, now you can see on the top, and by the way, these green videos, these are real videos taken really off the screen of a VP8. This isn't something I created a simulation of in the computer. This is an analog device, and I videotaped right off the screen when I made these. And you can see from the top image, we could turn up and down the gain, making it positive or negative. But if you look at the bottom one, look at his face, his nose, his deep set eyes, the protruding forehead, the swollen cheeks, the beard, the hands, you can even see fingers. 
the natural relief of a human form. Now, it's a crude image because that eight in VP8 stands for eight bits, which tells us only eight levels of gray to create the image from black to white. So it's not a very smooth, refined image. But this was enough to become the catalyst for our team being formed. So that story I told you at the beginning, this is the effect of it. And this is what started it all. Now, when I was at my friend Kevin's house in 1997 making these videos, I said, you know, Kevin, I'm going to stand in front of an audience and I'm going to tell them, you know, a normal photograph doesn't do this. So I said, I need a normal photo. So I went over to his wall and I took a picture of his grandchildren off the wall. And I put them into the VP8. Interestingly enough, the kid on the left got married last year. I got invited to the wedding, actually. Uh, and now let's look at the bottom one here. That'll be the best example. Notice that his hair is going down into his head. You see that? Notice that his nose and cheeks are flat. His eyes are weird looking and his mouth is grossly distorted. Kind of looks like a monster out of a horror movie. And the poor little kid on the right, his face is just flat. There is no dimensionality at all there. And that tells us that although you get a result in the VP8, but it's not the natural relief of the human form of his face or his body the way the shroud yields. So you can see this was the catalyst. Now, the good news is I'm talking to an audience that knows what a dark room is. Because when I talk to 10 year olds, they say a dark room, that's my bedroom when mom turns out the lights. That's it. Well, fortunately, photography is not limited to eight levels of gray. We have a much broader gray scale that we work with. And so now, my friend Aldo Goreski, an Italian professional photographer, a dear friend, I just heard from him today, believe it or not, um, he took a technique that we did in the darkroom called edge enhancement, and he calls it photo relief. But what it does is, it extracts that information, and now, look at the face now. Now it's very clear, you can see the deep set eyes, the brows, the swollen cheeks, the nose, the mouth, the hands, fingers, all the way down the knees. You can see the back of the body, the thighs, calves, all the way down to the feet. You can see a lot more detail and it's smoother and more refined than the limitations of that old VP8 image analyzer. Now Aldo, being the smart guy that he is, realized he wanted to prove in one single image that photo normal photographs don't yield the result, but the shroud does. So he had his daughter, Paula, on the left, hold a photo of the shroud. And he applied the edge enhancement technique to the whole thing. Now on the right, Paula's not looking so pretty anymore. But notice that the effect on the shroud is the natural relief of the face. That is actually encoded into the shroud's image. It's really there. I've now shown you two different ways. And we even put Aldo's photo into a VP8. And you can see poor Paula, <laughs> look at her face in that. Ooh. Not so good. Her nose is sort of going into her head. Uh, her mouth is, her cheeks, it's obviously not the natural relief of her face. But the shroud image, same thing. Now, we do live in a digital age. And back in about 1998, a gentleman contacted me and said, hey, look, if you send me a shroud image, I have a piece of software we call it Bryce. It's used in uh, animation for creating topographical backgrounds. And so I sent him a facial image, and he sent me this back. Now remember, this is 1998 when computers were just sort of beginning to be, they were in their infancy compared to where we are today. And yet, he got the same results using a digital technique. The point that I want to make simply is there is definitely depth or topographical information encoded into the shroud's image, and I've shown you three different techniques of visualizing it, completely different from each other. It's really there. So, our team starts working in regional groups. I was in California, so the Jet Propulsion Lab guys were there, Brooks Institute of Photography, my alma mater, where I was on the faculty by then. Um, they were part of the group uh, my friend Don Devan, the atomic bomb guy, he was a part of the group. He was in Santa Barbara. Then there was a group in Colorado that included uh, scientists from the Air Force Academy and the Air Force Weapons Laboratory. There was a group in New Mexico, the group from Los Alamos and Sandia Laboratories. And then there was a group back east, New England Institute, that included our blood chemist, 
and some of our medical guys. So we were working in these kind of individual groups and we worked over a period of 17 months. Months, not weeks. And what we did was we planned every experiment, we planned every test, we decided what, we, what instruments we would need, and one of the things, the biggest concern was how do we maintain no damage to this cloth while we examine it, and they got the idea to use a steel table and fasten the cloth to it using magnets. That way they wouldn't do any harm to the cloth. And so, it, ironically, we asked the people in Turin to give us the dimensions of the shroud. They gave us the dimensions, we fabricated the table. When we put the actual shroud on it, the table was a bit short. In 1978, they didn't have the accurate dimensions of the Shroud of Turin. That's how little was known about it at that moment in its history. Now, here you can see there's using a replica of the shroud, and we're laying it on the table. This is a, a dry run, a month before we went to Turin. And you can see, by the way, there's Don Lin from the Jet Propulsion Lab, my hero on the team, may he rest in peace. And so we tested all our instruments and we got everything, everything seemed to be working fine, so we packed it all up into wooden crates, 80 crates, seven tons, and we shipped it off to Italy. Now, I'm gonna make a statement that's gonna seem hard to believe. There was no Pope when we examined the shroud. Not at all, and here's why. We were scheduled to go to Italy on September 30th. The evening of September 29th, John Paul I died. Right, so we're all on the phone. Remember, no emails, no faxes even. We're all on the phone trying to figure out what we're gonna do because, you know, is this gonna have some impact on our ability to examine the shroud? Now I have to point out to you that it was not the church that gave us permission to examine the shroud. It was the owner of the shroud, King Umberto II, the last Duke of Savoy, the last monarch of Italy, 1946. The Italians, after Mussolini, decided we don't want one guy in charge anymore. They kicked the monarchy out, and they went to exile in Portugal, but they still owned the shroud. And so it was the shroud's owner, King Umberto, who approved our 75-page test plan and gave us permission to examine the cloth. I don't think that the authorities in Turin were very happy about that. Had it been just up to the church, I doubt we would have ever been given permission, be honest. But because it was King Umberto and because the church were effectively the custodians of the shroud, they had to go along with it, but they were not happy. <coughs> anyway, by the way, just to kind of finish that part of the story, we examined the shroud from October 8th to October 13th, five days. And Pope John Paul II was elected October 16th, meaning there was no pope when we examined the shroud. So I didn't want you to think I was being crazy about that. That's really the truth. So let's go to Turin. We get to Turin. By the way, the very first thing they tell us when we get to Turin, bad news, guys. Italian customs have seized your equipment and they refuse to release it. Why did they seize our equipment? Because we had a small x-ray machine, low power, <coughs> and that small x-ray machine was in a crate, and on the outside of the crate was a radiation sticker. Obviously put the fear of God into the Italian customs folks, because they seized our equipment. Now we were there a week in advance to get everything unpacked and ready. The shroud was on public display uh, to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the shroud in Turin, 1578 to 1978 and we were gonna get it as soon as it came off public display. Well, like I said, the equipment is tied up where they're a week early and they don't release it. In the meantime, let me show you where the shroud is kept. This is the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. Right behind it is the dome of the Guarini Chapel. The Guarini Chapel was built specifically with a big beautiful black marble altar to house the reliquary of the shroud. Behind the glory, and by the way, you can go right behind the main altar of the cathedral, and the doorway right, leads right into the Guarini Chapel. There's a back door to the Guarini Chapel that leads into this square building here. That's the Royal Palace of Turin, where the monarchy had had their seat of power until they got kicked out of Italy. And so all the buildings are connected and adjoining each other. And in that Royal Palace is where we were going to have to examine the shroud. And as you'll see, not the best place. 
Now, the shroud was on public display, as I mentioned, and, you know, for what it is, it doesn't seem to be there's that many people there, but you see that little white building to the left over here? This one back here? Well, let's look a little closer. Yeah, <laughs> how'd you like to wait in that queue for 10 hours? Matter of fact, all those little umbrellas on the left, those are little kiosks set up to give people food and water while they waited for 10 hours, bless you, uh, for 10 hours in line uh, just to get two or three minutes in front of the shroud. I have good news. In successive public exhibitions, there's this new invention you might have heard of called the Internet. And a year before a public exhibition is scheduled, the Turin authorities on the Archdiocese of Turin's website put up a registration form, and they tell you pick a date and a time that you want to see the shroud, and they give you the, you know, what's available. You pick that date and time, and they tell you don't come early, show up on time, because in this day, back in those days, it's kind of like uh, Black Friday at Walmart, you know, how everybody shows up hours and hours in advance, and that's exactly what happened here, and that's why there were 100,000 people in the queue waiting as, uh, as long as 10 hours. Nowadays, when they have a public exhibition and people follow the rules of just showing up at the appointed time, you can wait maybe an hour. Uh, last time I was there in 2015, they had a public exhibition. It took about 15 minutes. It's always a little longer on the weekends because more people come when they're out of work, off, you know, off work. Uh, but no more than an hour or two at the worst case scenario, but that's way better than 10 hours. And so things have improved along those lines. Inside the cathedral is where the shroud is displayed. You'd come down the left side here. There's the shroud. You can barely see it, but there's people standing below it. After two or three minutes, they usher you out and the next group comes in. This glass wall behind the main altar, that's a glass wall looking into the Guarini Chapel, which looks like this. Well, at least it used to. In 1995, big chunks started falling out of the dome. And by the way, the shroud was kept behind this grating in the altar in its wooden reliquary box. But in 1995, as chunks started falling out of these, this beautiful dome, they were afraid it's going to kill somebody. These are big, heavy chunks of, I don't know if it's concrete or what. Anyway, it was falling out, and they decided, you know what, we've got to repair this. They raised 25 million euros, I'm imagining, and they moved the shroud in its wooden box out into the, in front of the main altar of the cathedral, and they put it behind about two, three inch thick bulletproof glass and kind of encased in this bulletproof glass, and so people couldn't see the shroud, but they could see the reliquary itself. Well, just as they finished and completed the work, Scaffolding was still in place, the work was completed, they'd spent all this money. An arsonist got in there, set a fire, completely gutting the Guarini Chapel, damaging the adjacent palace and the adjacent cathedral. Interestingly enough, a guy named Mario Trematori, who happens to be an expert in Baroque art, but was also a member of the volunteer fire department, fire brigade, lived only two blocks from the cathedral, saw the fire, came running, ran up to the fire truck, put on his helmet and his coat and his gloves, grabbed a nine-pound hammer. It's a sl small sledgehammer. Nobody told Mario that a nine-pound hammer cannot break bulletproof glass. So he ran in and broke the bulletproof glass and grabbed the shroud reliquary and ran it out the front of the cathedral. How about that? Is that a miracle? Some people say it is. Anyway, what's really funny is, obviously, people accused Mario of being a hero. Mario says, no, because the whole thing's on video. Because the training officer of the fire brigade shows up in his street clothes, no helmet, no coat, and he's making a video of Mario beating his way through the bulletproof glass, grabbing the reliquary and running it out the front door of the cathedral, and he's not wearing any, and there's all this burning stuff falling on the guy. So Mario says the real hero is the guy who made the video. And if you go to shroud.com, there's a special page just for the 1997 fire, and there's a video link to a YouTube video where you can watch Mario rescue the shroud. And a couple of years after that, about maybe seven or eight years later, uh, Mario and I were at a conference together, and he comes up to me, and you know how the Italians have these little beautiful little jewel boxes with cloisonne and beautiful little artwork and stuff. And he hands me this little jewel box, and I take it, and it rattles. 
And I go, well, what's in there? And he goes, open it, open it. And I open it up, and there's a piece of the glass that he broke. It's not a relic, don't get excited. <laughs> Never touch the shroud. Anyway, so this is what we're dealing with. And remember, while all this is still going on, we're all freaking out because five days have gone by and we still don't have our equipment. By the way, that's the reliquary they used to wrap it up in. They roll it up on a dowel, wrap it in red silk, and then this white cloth back here, believe it or not, is asbestos. Not a healthy thing to be around, period. And of course, you can see from the inside of the box, it's wood, but it has silver artwork on the outside, but it's a wooden box. Well, that's what it looks like today. It's a much better view of it. This is uh, in the museum in Turin, because after that fire and the shroud was rescued, they decided they would put the shroud on display in 1998 to show everybody that it was safe and sound, hadn't been damaged. But they also realized maybe a wooden box isn't the best thing to keep it in. Maybe rolling it up isn't a great idea. So what they did was they created, <clears throat> I think it was the Italian gas company put up another 20 million or so euros and they created a very special cabinet into which the shroud is now kept. It's now kept flat, no more rolling it up. It's in a nitrogen argon atmosphere to keep it out of the polluted air of Turin because it's a city and there's pollution and that would be harmful. It's also in a light tight cabinet and the temperature and humidity controlled by computers. And of course, it's now in a fireproof cabinet. What a wonderful surprise. Anyway, this is what you would see if you go to Turin today in the cathedral. It's in the niche in the front left of the cathedral as you come in. You can't see the shroud, but as you can see, you could pray there. You can kneel before, but you will not be able to see the actual shroud. Although a few blocks away is that museum where I just showed you a photo from. And you can always go there if you're going to be in Turin. By the way, the next public exhibition of the shroud is scheduled for 2025. That's the next holy year of the Catholic Church. How many Jews know that, do you think? <laughs> yeah, anyway, probably not many, to be honest, to answer my own question. Anyway, in the meantime, they let us into the palace where we're going to be examining the shroud, although our equipment's not released. So, oh, but yeah, remember I talked about the museum? I told you I was going to show you a picture. Yeah, that's me. I was only 32 now. I'm 40 years older than that now. But I still have a lot of hair. It's just falling off the back of my head now. Anyway... And you know what's really ironic? In the old days, I would point to this, oh, look at that old technology note next to that brand new Nikon F3, beautiful, blah, blah, blah. Both equally obsolete today because they both use film. That's right. So things have changed. My story changes over the years because technology has changed. Anyway, let's see if, there you go. Anyway, they led us into the royal palace. Well, I'm from Pittsburgh. Not too many royal palaces in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I figure while I'm here, let me make some photos for myself, just for fun. I'm in the room that we would be examining the shroud in in this photograph, and I'm looking down a hallway which we use basically as a closet and stored stuff down there. And also in the ceilings were these beautiful frescoes. This is in the room we call the equipment maintenance room had actually been a bedroom for visiting royalty back in the days when the palace was still being used as a palace. Now remember, I made these photographs just for myself. There was no need for them for the team or for the study of the shroud. That's the fresco in the room in which we examined the shroud for five days and nights when we looked up. This is what we saw, and trust me, my photograph does it no justice at all. I mean, this was so amazing that I stood there looking at this for a long time and I'm looking at what looked like sculptures. I mean, actually like reliefs, it's flat. It's a fresco painted into wet plaster flat. But it was so realistic that I remember asking Mr. Tonelli, who is the uh, curator of the palace, which was now a museum, Mr. Tonelli, who, who is the artist that did this magnificent work? And in typical Italian style, he kind of waved his hand and goes, nobody important. Google nobody important, see what you find. Anyway, so we're making these photos. In the meantime, five and a half days go by. Remember earlier I mentioned the Holy Shroud Guild, the four priests in New York that were promoting the shroud here in the U.S., or not here in the U.S., there in the U.S. Um, 
Well, one of those priests was a man named Peter Rinaldi. Peter Rinaldi was born in Turin. He was an altar boy in the Turin Cathedral in 1931 when it was displayed. He became a priest, although that's less of a surprise because there's a, a saint in the Rinaldi family already. But Father Peter knew how things got done in Turin and on the fifth day he said, look, I'm going to the customs office. I'm going to get the equipment out. So he goes down to the customs office and he says, uh, who's the man in charge? So the guy comes out. He says, I'm in charge, Father. What can I do for you? He says, well, what is your name, sir? Well, now the guy's <coughs> a little bit, well, Father Peter's big tall guy with a very deep, imposing voice. And when he spoke English, with a very thick Italian accent. I'm not going to imitate him. Um, Father Peter says, what is your name? He says, why do you want my name? He says, well, there's about to be an international incident, and I want to give you credit for it. Then he slipped him 100,000 lira, and the equipment was immediately released and put on a dump truck. <laughs> Don't get excited. 100,000 lira, $80. Okay, not a, not a huge amount. Sounds good, though. Listen, ladies, when you went shopping in Turin in those days before the changeover to the uh, euro, you would see a pair of shoes for 2.9 million lira. Put the fear of God in you, right? <laughs> but at the same time, that's why the Italians were so happy to get off the lira. Although I was in Holland and they were really unhappy to get off the guilder, which was a thousand-year-old currency that had been rock solid for centuries. Hey, wasn't my idea. Anyway, this is in the courtyard of the royal palace. Remember, it's a big square building and inside is a courtyard. And I'm standing and making this photo, and I'm thinking, you know, any second now, that guy's going to pull the lever and just knock our, dump our equipment out. But somebody actually ran up to their driver and said, please don't dump out the equipment. And the driver kind of looked at it incredulously. He said, well, of course not. You guys unload the truck, please. <laughs> so now we have to unload the truck and move all this equipment in. We're a day and a half away from them bringing us the shroud. And here we are having to just move all these crates of equipment into the palace. Eventually, we got to move in. We unpacked everything, got it all set up. We did not sleep for that day and a half, obviously. There wasn't time for sleeping. If you look close, that's me peeking my head around the back corner of the uh, of a table. Yeah, that's me, all right. Anyway, notice that table. If you look closely, you'll see the table seems to have re removable panels. You see one right clearly there. Well, the reason we have removable panels we brought an x-ray machine with us, the one that got us stuck in customs, and you can't take x-rays through steel. Now, I want to point out that this is not a stainless steel table, and I was sort of puzzled at that myself, and I talked to one of the chemists, and they said, stainless steel is treated with certain chemicals. They could be harmful to the shroud. We didn't want to risk that, so it's plain steel. Well, there's a problem with that. By the time we got it to Turin, shipped it across the ocean, got it unpacked, there was a white powdery corrosion on every piece, on every surface of the panels. Well, let me show you how smart these guys were. They knew that could happen. They weren't certain. But to be safe, remember we had two guys from NASA there. And what they brought with us were two rolls of gold foil mylar, the same stuff you've seen in the cargo bay of the space shuttle, or on satellites, it's that gold-colored stuff. And in America, I can always say, that's your tax dollars at work. But not for you Canadian, it didn't cost you a cent. Anyway, we had to cover every one of these panels because we couldn't put the shroud on there because this corrosion would have contaminated it. But these guys were smart enough to anticipate that and bring with them the solution. <laughs> I'm laughing because uh, I used to say, oh, look at this modern technology in front of that old tapestry, except this was modern technology before the advent of solid-state electronics. So that means there were hand-wired circuit boards in this box. I have no idea, by the way, what this instrument is, but I'll bet you have an app for that in your phone <laughs> nowadays. I have no idea what it is. And here's the unpacking of some of our photographic equipment. I'm going to go through, ah, the equipment maintenance room. Here's a better view of it. Notice the parquet wooden floors, which, by the way, when you walked on them, moved. This over 400-year-old building. 
Not only that, in those days, the Turin authorities allowed traffic to run right next to the building. That means every time a truck or a bus went by, the building would vibrate, dust would fall. Well, that could create some problems for some of our experiments. But most importantly, notice the garden hoses. We had a piece of equipment that needed to be water-cooled. Well, turns out, now I'm standing, when I make this photo, I'm standing in the doorway looking into the room. If you look really close, you'll see a doorway back here, and to the right through that doorway is into the room where we examine the shroud. So I'm making this photo, and to my left is a long hallway, and at the very end of that hallway is the only functioning bathroom in that half of the royal palace that we had access to. So, to water cool our piece of equipment, we had to run out and buy a whole bunch of garden hoses and string them from the bathroom all the way down the hallway through the equipment maintenance room and into the room where we examined the shroud. And you can see them right there coming into that room. And there you can see our table. And I think you can pretty much see those panels are there. Of course, they're not yet covered with the mylar, but they will be, as you'll see. Anyway, so right off the bat, can you see that this wasn't exactly the laboratory setting you might have imagined us to be in? Yet we had to make do. And of course, we did some thermal imaging or infrared imaging. And that meant that we had to cover the, the windows because the old shutters were beautiful, but they had cracks in them, and the sunlight would stream through, and it would wreak havoc with our instruments, our thermal instruments. So we had to put foil on all the windows. Now, there's the guy I did the atomic bomb thing with, Don Devan. That is not me. That's Sam Pellicori. He's an optical physicist. And Vern Miller, the chief scientific photographer, because I couldn't have done it all myself. When we, early on in the team, they started making a list of all the photography that needed to be done. I said, listen, if I work 24 hours a day, I couldn't do all that by myself. They said, well, what do you recommend? I said, well, how about I call Vern Miller, who had been my professor at Brooks Institute years earlier and had a lot more experience in some of these scientific types of photography that needed to be done than I did at the time. And what are they doing here? Well, look, you can see, by the way, if anybody's interested, there's the Hasselblad, one of the Hasselblad cameras we used. It's a motorized Hasselblad, the same Hasselblad model that NASA left six of on the moon because they've gathered up all the moon rocks and these cameras are kind of heavy so they left the cameras brought back the film and the moon rocks love to get my hands on one of those but understand they were specially prepared to operate in the vacuum of space too so what they're doing here notice there's a rail system that the camera is on and look the shroud is long and the room we were in was not very deep and we couldn't back away far enough to get the whole thing in, and if we did, it would be too small anyway, so we needed to shoot it in sections. Well, these guys realized that the best thing we could do was take this camera rail system, measure it carefully, sandbag it into place, so I could take a photo here of this half of the shroud, and then slide the camera to the other half and take the second photo of the other half of the shroud. You've already seen those photos I made. And 20 years later, when I put those, I had those photographs scanned professionally and put them into Photoshop to put them together to make the single image of the shroud, it was a perfect match because 20 years earlier, these guys designed this system for our camera support. Again, this just shows you how smart these men were and how thoughtful they were in looking into the possibilities of what could go wrong and trying to anticipate everything. Anybody been to Italy? Some of you have. Let's, uh, for those who aren't, I'm sure the folks here will verify the fact that nothing runs on time in Italy. I, well, I'll be in Rome again in May, and my friends say, oh, we'll pick you up at 8 o'clock, and at about 9.15 they arrive, and I'll look at my watch, and they go, Rome time. Okay, so imagine our shock and surprise when an hour and a half ahead of schedule, in, somebody comes in the room and yells, here comes the shroud. So here I am, I grab my camera, put the lens on, grab the flash unit, put that on the camera, turn it on, wait for it to charge up. Imagine telling this to a 10-year-old. <laughs> they always get a kind of a laugh, their eyes get wide. Well, really, you had to do all that? You couldn't just pull your phone out? No. Anyway, so I run out into the hallway. This is the back door of the Guarini Chapel. They just came out of that from the uh, uh, cathedral through the Guarini Chapel here into the hallway. 
They brought it past me through the equipment maintenance room into the room where we examined shroud. And ironically, the only thing sharply in focus is that wall back there. Yeah, but you know, sometimes the focus becomes less critical than capturing a moment that will never again be repeated. This will never happen again. So, so the focus is a little less critical here. Now, you can see some of the gold foil on some of the panels, and already the shroud is brought to us. Remember, this is an hour and a half ahead of schedule, so we're in trouble because, look, we haven't even finished covering the panels. And there's the shroud put before us. Now, there's a hidden story here. And, you know, I didn't even notice that I'd captured this moment. This only lasted 20 or 30 seconds in the event. See, the Italian scientists were not happy that we were there with big-name labs like Sandia and Jet Propulsion Lab and Los Alamos. So they told us, they said, and they lobbied to stop us right until the shroud was brought in the room, by the way. They told us, they said, look, okay. I mean, they, had to re they realized that we were going to examine the shroud. They realized it. So they said, well, okay, we see you're going to be able to examine the shroud, but don't touch it, because if you touch it, there were Cadabinetti, those are state policemen in plain clothes, armed, guarding, not us, the shroud. If you touch it, they're going to shoot you. So notice on the left of the Italian scientists and on the right of the American scientists, and notice where their hands are. <laughs> How do you examine the Shroud of Turin with your hands tied behind your back? Well, of course you can't. And over here, this bald gentleman, Professor Gio, this gentleman right here, um, Professor Gio starts handling the Shroud like it's nothing. And we're all waiting for the gunfire. <laughs> well, of course there was no gunfire. So I'm not sure if they were being mean-spirited or thought it was humorous, but this whole thing only lasted maybe 20 seconds, and it wasn't until a year or two later when I was really looking at the photos, I realized I captured that few seconds when they put their hands behind their back. So that's the hidden story. Now this is, and you can see, still not covered. Um, look over here, there's the shroud, and it's fastened to a piece of white painted wood. Guess how they fastened the shroud to the white painted wood? Thumbtacks. That means that every place there was a thumbtack, there was a hole in the shroud. And when they had to pull them out, of course, when they pulled them out, it, there was a little rusty hole with a circle of rust around it. We've all seen that. <laughs> and they were worried about us, right? They crucified the shroud. So now we're preparing it, and now they got to pull out all the thumbtacks. And they pulled out all the thumbtacks. And our table, once all the panels were covered, the table can rotate either horizontally or vertically. So it was rotated horizontally, and then the shroud, <clears throat> once it's been uncrucified, is transferred, simply just slid onto <clears throat> our table, and fastened in place with magnets. Now, these white things all around the periphery, those are magnets. Why are they white? Because we didn't want to even let one particle of metal from these magnets get onto the shroud, so all the magnets were coated with Teflon, which is inert, and they used thumbtacks. <laughs> you know? Pretty amazing. But of course, because we were Americans, we couldn't go first. <clears throat> who went first? Uh, this gentleman, Max Fry. Now, Max Fry was a, a criminal investigator, a criminalist, crime scene investigator, CSI kind of guy, collecting data at the crime scenes. Max Fry came up with the idea of using sticky tape on the clothing of crime scene victims to lift debris that could be then used to help solve the crime. Very clever guy. There's a big difference, however, between the Shroud of Turin and the clothing of a crime scene victim, because once they're finished pulling all the stuff off of, off of it and getting all the data from it, they put it in a bag, put it on a shelf, and nobody cares about it anymore. Shroud's a little different. And Max, <clears throat> apparently on the way to the palace, stopped off and bought himself the cheapest roll of dime store sticky tape he could find. And you know how you can tell it's bright red? Look at the container. You know right away this is not scotch tape, okay? And the reason I say that is because we too had a tape experiment 
And we went to 3M. You might have heard of them. And they manufactured a special tape for us that would leave no gummy residue on the shroud when it was removed. And it had specific optical properties in the acetate base so we could do polarized light microscopy directly on those tapes. A little different than Max, and then Max starts doing this. That's what we said. <laughs> oh no. I mean, if we'd done this, they would have shot us, I'm sure. Max is doing this, and we're all looking at each other going, really, this is how they're gonna do this? I mean, we were shocked. And then Max takes his dime store sticky tape, and he walks over to the face of the man of the shroud, and he's just about to stick it down. That's the most iconic part of the shroud's image. He's just about to stick it down when John Jackson, one of the co-founders of our team, runs over, grabs him, and yanks him away. I mean, just like that. And if it looks like they're about to hit each other and the man in the middle is acting as a referee, that's exactly what's happening. The man in the middle is Professor Luigi Ganella, then the late Professor Luigi Ganella, the man who was the scientific advisor to the Archbishop of Turin. And after about a 10 minute very heated discussion, and I think you can just tell by looking at it that it was a very heated discussion, at the end of that they decided no one would have put any face or tape on the face, which of course makes sense. Because everywhere Max stuck his tape, he left some stickiness on the surface that over time, you know how dust and dirt and debris will get stuck to it, and they had to clean it. Fortunately, it's not that difficult, but still, imagine if we had done this. Anyway, Max does his thing, he's finished, and then the man in the white lab coat on the right, Professor uh, Giovanni Rigi, is given the next opportunity to examine the shroud. Professor Rigi got a call two weeks before this event, and they said, look, uh, the Americans are coming, we want you to do something. That's all, do something, because you gotta go ahead of the Americans. Rigi had two weeks, no budget of any kind, and Rigi's a smart guy, wonderful man, may he rest in peace. Most, most of these people are dead, sadly, it's 40 years later. Rigi gets the idea, and remember I told you that when the fire damage occurred to the shroud, the poor Claire sister sewed those triangular patches into it that you see? They also sewed a backing sheet onto the cloth because to, just to add more support, they could sew down to that backing sheet and it gave it more stability. Well, nobody had seen the backside of the Shroud of Turin in 450 years. So he gets the idea to separate the Shroud from the backing sheet and insert an endoscopic camera between the two to look at the backside. <clears throat> That's very clever. And also a vacuum to vacuum dust and debris from between the two cloths. So considering that he had no time, no budget, pretty smart idea, some, something to do. So here they are separating the shroud from the backing sheet. And I'm making this photograph and I'm thinking, any second now, we're gonna get that first look at the backside of the shroud. So I ran around to the other side of the table just in time to make what is probably the most well-known photograph of the event that I took in 1978. That is the precise moment where we saw the backside of the shroud of Turin for the first time in 450 years. And this one's in focus. And it was in Life Magazine and National Geographic and Time and Newsweek, it's a pretty popular photograph. And I think what makes it powerful is look at their faces, look at this, how serious they are. This is, this is not a bunch of crazy people, this is real hardcore scientists taking what they're doing totally seriously. And I think maybe that's why this image has been so powerful. I, I don't know what the sister was thinking, my guess is, mamma mia. <laughs> That's a guess, I don't know. But I looked over to her and I saw her standing there and she's charged with the care of the shroud and here we all are poking at it and messing with it. My heart went out to her. Now I have to give you the sad news about the two experiments done by Professor Rigi. In uh, 1978, if you understand how endoscopic cameras work, there's a lens at one end and a camera at the other end and a big fiber optic in between. Well. Fiber optic bundles in 1978 were just a bunch of thin glass lines, if you will, wires, if you will, 
bound together into a, a single bundle. So they would pass light through, but it resulted in an image that looked like, you've seen the photo taken through the eye of a fly, a bunch of little circles with spaces in between them. Well, unfortunately, that's the best fiber optics they had in 1978. So none of the images that he made were effectively very useful scientifically, but it was still a brilliant idea. And the same problem, there was a problem with the vacuuming experiment, which he did, and you'll see that in a moment. Um, the vacuuming experiment, look, you can vacuum stuff from between the two cloths, but how do you, if you find a particle in the dust that you've aspirated or vacuumed, how do you know where it came from? Did it come from the shroud? Did it come from the hauling cloth, the backing sheet? Or did it come from somewhere else? There's no provenance to anything you'll find in those dusts. So there was no real scientific value in the end for even the dust that he removed, sadly enough. And by the way, those are the sisters' hands removing a small sample of the shroud, not for us, but for the Italian team. Now, here's Professor Rigi. He's putting a, a thing between the shroud and the backing sheet to hold them apart so he could put his endoscopic camera and his vacuum, uh, vacuum thing in. And there's the vacuum. It's obviously not the kind we use around the house. It's a laboratory vacuum. Up in the handle, sterile filters are placed so he could vacuum an area, label the filter, change it out for another filter. So, I mean, it would, look, it was a really good idea considering he had no prep time. Remember, we had 17 months, he had two weeks. So I, I, I felt for him, but he was a smart guy. He understood that his endoscopic camera could see an image 10 centimeters in diameter. So how do you know what you're looking at from underneath? There were no video uh, playback systems that you could look at. It was hooked up to a film camera. So you really couldn't see what you were looking at. But he got the idea. He said, well, wait a minute. And he had a string grid fabricated with 10 centimeter squares. So that when he turned his focusing lamp on, he could center that up over any part of the shroud he wanted and he'd know precisely where he was looking from the backside. Now, I consider that an elegant and brilliant approach to what would be a really complicated problem otherwise. And when he turned that focusing lamp on, remember the photo before it, kind of weird when I do that, it kind of looks blue there for a minute, you notice that? That's uh, the way your eyes work, it's uh, called uh, persistence of vision for anybody who's technically oriented. Anyway, he turns that light on. I asked for the room lights to be turned out because this is the first piece of scientific evidence that proves the shroud is not a painting that I can show you. And here's why. This is the blood stain on the forehead. With light transmitted through the cloth, you can see that there's added density where the blood soaked into the cloth. Now remember, conventional wisdom was this is an artwork, it's been painted, so they said to me, Barry, we want you to photograph the entire shroud with transmitted light. They'd have to remove half the panels, put some lights back there, I'd make the photo, put the panels back in, move down, do the other half, same thing. Because if the shroud were a painting and somebody had applied paint or pigment or binder or something like that to create the image, we would see it with transmitted light. Well, let's look at what we see, look. Spear wound blood stain, blood stain in the arms, blood stain at the wrist, water stains, scorches and burns and patches and holes, blood stain at the feet. What don't we see? The image. There's no image there. And this is the first scientific evidence that we have that proves this is not a painting. And here, let me orient your eyes. There's the image. There you go. So this is the first proof that I can show you that the shroud's not a painting because the paint would have then absorbed into the cloth with transmitted light, it would have added density, we would have seen it, we'd have come home, or at least I would have. I was a skeptic. And so there's the evidence. And probably, maybe the most important photographs I made from a scientific point of view are these transmitted light images. I'm only showing you one, I did both halves. Same effect on both, no image visible. Because the image, turns out, is two microns deep on the top surface of the top fibrils of the cloth, nothing penetrates in. No way it's an artwork, folks. And this is the first piece of hard science I can show you to prove that. Now, this is the part where I could easily put you to sleep by just saying words like in infrared reflectance spectroscopy. That would put you to sleep pretty quick. So what I decided to do, I'm gonna show you the instruments, 
and I put on the screen the experiments that those instruments were responsible for. That way it gives you the, uh, you know, the opportunity to look at the picture, read those few words, and then move to the next one. I want you to notice, <laughs> I laugh. This is one of the most sophisticated spectral instruments that existed on the planet in 1978. This lady and her husband owned the Oriel Corporation. They invented and developed this spectral instrument, and they sold it to governments all over the world, and to military. Anybody who needed to do spectral analyses was using the Oriel Corporation's instruments. They were on our team. Cool. Notice the chart recorder. Now, you see this big monstrous thing in this chart recorder. Today, oh, good catch. Today, hey, my reflexes are good for 72 years old. <laughs> anyway, today this whole thing would be in a small handheld instrument. You put on a tripod to make it solid, point it at the shroud, and there'd be a little wire coming out into a laptop, USB, and we would record the whole thing, boy, record the whole thing into our computers. But we didn't have any computers, pretty much. Anyway, so let's continue on here. Aha! There's the little devil that cost us five days in customs. It's a low-power x-ray, because x-rays could be harmful to that old piece of cloth. And so that gives us a problem. This is a low-power x-ray. The exposure time, you know when the dentist puts that little thing in your jaw and he goes, okay, hold it, click, click, takes about a second. The exposures with this device, 20 minutes. Now I'm gonna remind you, those parquet wooden floors, that, that move, if you know, 20 minute exposure, if something moves, it's blurred. How about the traffic running next to the building, vibrating the building? They could only make x-rays in the middle of the night when there was no traffic. We all had to leave the room because if we walked around, we would blur the x-ray. The poor guy that had to make the exposures, Bill Modern, may he rest in peace, died two years ago. He had to put his feet in position, start the exposure, couldn't move his feet for 20 minutes. Not so easy, but they made 43 x-rays over the five nights. Now the x-rays, pretty amazing. There's one of them. But the x-rays present a new problem. So, if we expose these x-rays, put them back in the box, and bring them back to process them in the United States, means they have to go through the x-ray machines at the airport. That isn't gonna work. So they understood that they had to process the x-rays on site. What do you need to process x-rays? Well, you only need two things. You only need, besides the chemicals, you need a room that can be made totally dark, and you need a water supply. <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do. We had to, and the, the funniest part of this is that whenever they were planning to process some, some of the film, they would come in the room with the shroud and say, uh, anybody need to go to the bathroom? You better go, and just like we do with the kids before we take them on a long car ride. And they had to do that every time they wanted to process the x-rays. But remember that they thought of all this in advance and brought with them everything necessary to do that. Pretty amazing. I mean, I'm still blown away, and I was a member of the team to show how smart these guys were to think of all this in advance. We also did photographs through a microscope. By the way, we didn't own that a piece of equipment. The manufacturer loaned it to us for the project. And there, and I say this with great reverence to my Catholic brothers and sisters, that is the blood of the man of the shroud. And this is the evidence that kept me from accepting the shroud's authenticity for 17 years. Why? Because the blood's still red and old blood turns black or brown within an hour. Why is the blood still red? I had pretty much been convinced by all the other evidence. Remember, I already told you in the first 30 minutes I knew it wasn't a painting and then the science proved that in the end. But nobody explained to me why the blood was red. Until 1995, I was on the telephone with Dr. Alan Adler, the blood chemist on our team, and the third Jewish guy, I have to add. <laughs> well, of course, have to. 
And Al was a kind of a strange bird. He was a brilliant chemist, never drove a vehicle a day in his life. You know how God keeps us equal. He gives us a gift in one area, but takes something away elsewhere. <laughs> and Al never drove a car a day in his life, couldn't do it. And Al's idea of humor was wearing a blood red t-shirt with the chemical symbol for hemoglobin on it. He thought that was hilarious. Nobody knew what it was besides Al, maybe another blood chemist. But I was on the phone with Al one day in, in 95, and, and he said to me, truthfully, he said, you know, Bear, I'm pretty much getting to believe this thing's got to be the real thing. This is another Jewish guy, remember? And I said, yeah, Al, but nobody's explained why the blood is still red. And I remember he's a blood chemist. Boy, did he get upset at that moment. He yelled at me. He said, didn't you read my paper 17 years ago? I said, yeah, Al, I, I did, actually. He said, well, I said, well, you're a chemist and I'm a photographer. Uh, you know, I'm no chemist. He said, well, if you'd read my paper, you'd see that I, I found a huge amount of bilirubin in the blood. Bilirubin's not a Jewish guy from New York, by the way. <laughs> well, m maybe, maybe there is a bilirubin in New York, I don't know, but bilirubin is a compound made in the liver that's pumped into the blood, particularly when somebody's been beaten, scourged, goes into hypovolemic shock, has, you know, gotten no uh, liquid into his body, and has bled and perspired. And so the liver pumps all this bilirubin into the bloodstream. So bilirubin is a hemolytic agent. It breaks down the cell walls of the red blood cells, releasing hemoglobin, which stays red forever. And when Al told me that, I realized that the last piece of the puzzle had just come to me. And at that moment in time, I had to accept that the Shroud of Turin was 100% authentic. But it took all those years. Now somebody said, why didn't you ask Al that question 17 years earlier? That's a valid question. I don't know why I didn't. But in the long run and looking back now from this point in my life, I realized I wasn't ready for the answer earlier than that. As a young man, I was pretty arrogant and egotistical. I would have done this for the wrong reasons. God knew what was in my heart, and he made me wait until 1995 because shortly after the conversation with Adler where I'd become convinced of the Shroud's authenticity, I got a phone call from another friend. It's funny how these things came over the phone. Thank you, Lord. Came over the phone, my friend calls me up and goes, you know that Shroud thing you're involved with? And I said, yeah, I know that Shroud <laughs> thing I'm involved with. Uh, he says, well, you know, it turns out that's just a photo made by Leonardo da Vinci. I, I laughed, too. I thought he was joking. He said, no, I'm serious. I said, really? I said, where are you getting your information? I said, I'm no historian, but if I'm not mistaken, the shroud was being publicly displayed 100 years before da Vinci was born. He was a good artist, but he wasn't that good. I said, where are you getting your information? He said, well, my wife and I were checking out at the grocery store. Yeah, good old National Enquirer. <laughs> and at that moment in time, I had an epiphany. I realized how privileged I had been, how I had been given the, the ability to be in that room when maybe a billion other people had more right to be there. And I realized that the average person out there doesn't read peer-reviewed scientific journals, especially back in those days when you had to have access to a research or university library just to get to the darn thing. And so while I'm on the phone with my Leonardo da Vinci buddy, there was a manila folder on my desk. I wrote four words, consider building a website. That was the moment where God reached down, smacked me upside the head and said, now here's the real job. And I built shroud.com within a few months of that, went online January of 96. We celebrated our 22nd anniversary online this past January. We have reached over 15 million people with that website, countless more with my lectures and appearances in 20-some TV documentaries and YouTube. There's over 2,800 videos of me on YouTube. I've never posted one. But I think I've probably reached more people than the church has when it comes to study of the Shroud. 
So finally, God reveals the job to me. And you know, for years after we finished, I didn't feel finished. I kept wondering, why was I there? What was my purpose in being there? What was me? It was always me, 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 me. And then I came to understand, I wasn't in that room for me. I was in that room for you. So that later on, I could bring this to you. That's why I was in the room. And so that's what we have based just on that one photo of blood, that story, okay? Let's continue on because we're running out of time fast. Getting me started is easy. It's getting me stopped. It's hard. <laughs> UV fluorescence photography. Well, basically, that's the type of photography that reveals things that you can't normally see with the naked eye. This is the spear wound blood stain. You can see the, the oval the blood flow, because of the patch and the burns, you don't see the blood that flowed around to the back, but that's where it came from. But look at the outside edges of that. Do you see a lighter area around the blood stain? That's a serum stain. You know, blood is made of solid matter and liquid. The liquid is serum. It flows out and spreads out via capillarity. But it's invisible except with ultraviolet fluorescence photography. So this amazing... A uh, forger from the medieval days who invented photography, discovered gravity, also hid this so that hope in 700 years somebody figure a way to see it. That's ridiculous. You know, obviously that's not the case. And there I am again. This is my living proof that I was really there. And one of my other duties was to document where all the other guys took their information from on the shroud. So, I got some little magnets, had them coated with Teflon, handed them out to the guys, and when they took data from a spot, they would put a magnet there. When they were finished in, in that particular area, I would come along with my camera and make photos like this. And then when we came back from Turin, I spent several months compiling those into, compo compositing them into a map, a series of eight maps for each of the different major experiments. And it took me months to do what I could do today in a couple of days in Photoshop. But there was no Photoshop in 1979 when I was doing these. And you can go to shroud.com and you, I mean, I'm just showing it to you, but not giving you the key information of what you're looking at. Not important, just to show you this was another thing I was responsible for. But if you go to shroud.com, you can find the paper and the mapping paper there. See all the maps with the keys that tells you what experiment and what, where they took their data. Uh, remember, we also had a sticky tape sample. I told you about that. Ray Rogers decided using his thumb to press down on the shroud probably wasn't the best idea. So he designed and had fabricated a torque applicator. You can see there's a steel roller here, there's a pointer, and there's a scale. It's a little hard to see in the photo, but he could apply a known amount of pressure when he applied his tapes. He also understood that when you peel the tape off, and you put it down on a glass slide, anything trapped in the gum of the tape is going to get pressed deeper into the gum, making it harder to evaluate. So he had designed and had fabricated special well slides. And if you look close, you can see, these, you can see the tapes. And you can see they're only touching at these edges. And there's a millimeter or two of space between the sticky tape and the glass below it. Also thought of, planned, designed, and fabricated before we went over there. Can you imagine? This, how smart this group was. And we had a computer. See, I lied a minute ago. <laughs> we did have a computer. Yeah. It's okay to laugh because it is pretty funny. This is an IMSI 8080. The AD80 indicates what chip is in this computer. You know the little magnetic clocks that you buy, two for a dollar or whatever it is? You put one on the fridge, and when the battery dies, you throw it away and put the other one up. That's the chip that's in this computer that's in that little clock. And, uh, you know, he didn't buy this computer. This was a kit. He had to build this computer. Yeah. And what's really funny is, see all the red and blue? I mean, the switches are really cool. I have no idea what they do. And unfortunately for Bob Ewing, the man there, by the way, this, this is called a terminal. And it's, yeah, I know, <laughs> it is funny. Uh, and it's got a screen and a keyboard. And all it ever could do was this. For five days and nights, he could only get it to do this. I have no idea what that is. I have no idea what he intended to do with this, considering that your phone has a, a, 
computer at 10,000 times more powerful. But really, the coolest part is the box that this computer is sitting on. It says, Digital Systems. It's an 8-inch floppy disk drive. <laughs> Try explaining that to a 10-year-old, okay? <laughs> and that is an 8-inch floppy disk. And guess how much it could store? 186 kilobytes. <laughs> yeah. Which means one of your iPhone photos would take, I don't know how many hundreds of disks, but a lot. So obviously, and you know, I felt so bad for him. For five days, he struggled with this. And all he could get it to do was this. So I felt badly for him. And he never published any data because he never could do anything with it, sadly. So we come back from Turin, collecting all this data. And we spend the next three years reducing the data, studying the data, evaluating it, writing it into, into papers, and submitting them to the finest peer-reviewed scientific journals that existed at, the, at that time. And we created what is to this day the primary database of scientific information about the Shroud of Turin. And remember, our primary goal was to go there and determine how the image was formed, not to prove it's Jesus, not to prove the resurrection. How is the image formed? What is the image? Painting, photograph, scorch, whatever. Well, we came back, we published our work, and in the end, we could not answer that question. We could tell you what it's not. It isn't a painting, and I've already shown you that evidence. It isn't a photograph, no silver anywhere on the cloth, which would have been necessary to make a photographic image. No, not a scorch, I'm not going to go into the technical reasons why it's not. But in the end, we know of no mechanism that can make an image with those chemical and physical properties. And trust me, folks, in the last 40 years, I've looked at every effort by every skeptic to create an image. They say, well, this is how it was done. And then we look at it, it doesn't even come close. The one thing we did do is we characterized the image. We proved that it's not paint. And by the way, just so you understand, the image on the shroud is monochromatic. So why does it look lighter and darker in places? It's just basically those fibers that constitute the image on the very top surface of the fibrils are just more yellowed than the surrounding ones. So why does it look lighter and darker in places? It's the concentration of those yellowed fibers. Now, if you've ever looked at a half tone in a magazine made of little dots, take, put a magnifier on a magazine reproduction, you'll find little dots. And the darker it is, the closer the dots appear. And the further apart the dots are, the lighter it appears to our eye. That's how the image on the shroud has its encoded three-dimensional information. Now, that is a challenge to science to this day. We live in the most image-oriented era of human history, and to this day we know of no mechanism that can make an image with these chemical and physical properties. And so, in a way, we sort of failed, even though we created the primary scientific database, but we really couldn't answer that one question. But there was a big article in National Geographic and Life magazine, and for a long period of time, once we finished our work and published it, for a good seven or eight years, most of the world accepted that the shroud was probably authentic. And then came the Three Stooges. In 1988, they allowed three laboratories to perform radiocarbon dating on one sample from the shroud, a tiny little corner. And look at the way they announced their results. Look at the blackboard in the background. Look at 1260 to 1390 exclamation point. Obviously a new form of scientific notation. And it's just amazing, the arrogance. Matter of, speaking of arrogance, look at, the, look at the photo top left. If I were going to create an illustrated dictionary to illustrate the word arrogance, I would use that photo. <laughs> These guys absolutely, I personally believe, had no intention of doing anything else but proving the shroud of fake. And look at the headline. It's not an honest headline. An honest headline would say, preliminary test shows shroud might not be old enough. That would be an honest headline. Instead, it says shroud is a fake. Well, you know, if you call something a fake, that means it's a copy of something that's original. Well, show me what it's a fake from. 
this is unique on the planet, it's not a fake. So what's wrong with the radiocarbon dating? Well, for the next 12, and look at the date range, 1260 to 1390 exclamation point. They say it can't be any earlier than 1260, right? Well, some of us had been studying the shroud for some time by then, and we knew something was wrong, but we, I'm no physicist. I'm not qualified to challenge three labs. The three labs were Zurich, Arizona, and Oxford in England. And the Turin authorities, trying to do this properly, went to the British Museum in London, and they asked the chief researcher of the British Museum to be the overseer of the three laboratories to make sure everything was done correctly. His name is Dr. Michael Tight. Now, you see that headline on the left, Turin Shroud shown to be a fake? As soon as that news broke, Oxford received one million pounds sterling anonymous for debunking the shroud. Whoa, is right. Not only that, Dr. Michael Tite leaves the British Museum, goes over to Oxford and takes a permanent chair at Oxford. How does that smell? Not so good. Now, I point this out, and I know I'm being streamed here, so I'm probably going to get hate mail or worse. Uh, the three labs were run by Anglicans. I'm not saying anything else. And Michael Tite was Anglican. And look, I have some great friends that are Anglican, so I'm not putting it on them. I'm just pointing something out, that's all. I'm not making any further comments, because I really don't want any hate mail. But that's also a fact. But some of us, when this came out, we knew something was wrong because of this. Look at this illuminated Hungarian manuscript. Note the date of it. Let's take a look at what this monk did when he illuminated this little manuscript. First of all, he shows a naked Jesus, hands crossed over his naked torso, no thumbs visible, pretty much like what we see on the shroud. He tries to simulate the herringbone weave with the zigzag pattern in his artwork. And most importantly, he includes a set of the L-shaped burn holes, which means he had seen them sometime before 1191. And look at this. What a coincidence he even gets the orientation right. What do you think of that? So much for 1260 being the earliest possible date. We knew this, and here, I'll show you. There they are, and look at this. Top layer, second layer, third layer, fourth layer. We know the shroud was folded in quarters when those burn holes were burnt into the cloth. Now, if you take a look at this piece, and by the way, some of the shroud is being covered by these things on the edge. If you take that cloth and fold it in quarters, because right now it's huge, but if you fold it in quarters, Guess what? It fits nicely on an altar. So what on an altar would cause burn holes? How about swinging that sensor a little too hard and maybe some incense or some charcoal falling onto the cloth and burning its way down through the layers? Now, I told you that in 2002 they did a restoration on the shroud, removed the patches, removed the backing sheet, Scraped away all the charred areas, including around the L-shaped burn holes, so we can never do chemical analysis of the char to determine if it was that or not. They vacuumed it so no pollen, proper pollen study can ever be performed. And then, believe it or not, those creases we've been talking about, they steamed it to get the creases out. The worst possible thing you can do to an ancient piece of linen is moisture, and they steamed it. And somebody at the end is probably going to ask me about DNA. Well, the woman who did the restoration, I mean, I've heard of restoring an artwork like the Sistine Chapel. It gets dirty over the centuries. You've got to clean it. But a relic? Who's ever heard of restoring a relic? And the Swiss uh, textile lady who did the work over 31 days, no gloves, no mask, no hairnet, no protective clothing, handled it with her bare hands, so if you're going to ask me about DNA later, which you might, I'm going to have to tell you that if we did a DNA analysis of the man of the shroud today, we'd find he was a Swiss woman. <laughs> because she left her DNA on every square inch of that cloth. And then she sewed a wider sheet on the back of it, making the image harder to see. 
cutting the apparent contrast, not changing what's on the surface, but we photographers know if you're gonna photo something, photograph something that has some translucency, you put black behind it, not white. They put a whiter sheet behind it, lowering the apparent contrast of the image, and I'll show you that at the very end here. So for, eight, uh, for 12 years after the carbon dating comes out, people were coming up with the craziest, wildest theories of what went wrong. There was a bioplastic coating on the surface that skewed the date. Turns out there is no bioplastic coating. Uh, there's some rare form of energy that we haven't discovered yet. Well, excuse me, but if we're going to go there, forget science. You've got to stay within the realm of science if you're going to give a scientific answer. So for 12 years, all these nonsensical theories are pr uh, promoted as to what was wrong with the carbon dating. In the end, none of them proved to be valid. Well, that's until these folks came along now. In 2000, there was a conference in Italy, and I, of course, I'm always in the front row with my camera, photographing the people at the podium. That's, you know, kind of what I do. And this young couple gets up, uh, Sue Benford and Joe Marino. They get up in front, and they say, look, um, we took, we got photos of the sample given to the uh, Zurich lab, and we took them to a textile expert in Ohio where they lived. And the textile expert looks at it and goes, aha, herringbone, old. Oh, look. Somebody has manipulated this. They didn't know, by the way, this was from the shroud. They just saw it was a photo. They didn't know. Well, somebody's manipulated this, and with great care, this has been manipulated. So Benford and Marino go, okay, well, that wasn't what they were expecting to hear. He says, thank you. And they went to another textile expert. But guess what? That's also called good science. That's how good science works. They went to another textile expert. This textile expert looks at it and goes, uh, Oh, herringbone, obviously old linen. Oh, look, this has been carefully manipulated by somebody with great skill, but an expert looking at it could tell there was some reweaving had gone on within that sample. Well, Benford and Marina are going, okay. Again, that's not why they took it to a textile expert, but that was the result they got from two independent ones who didn't know what they were looking at and gave the same result. They said, we're going to the horse's mouth when it comes to linen. Thomas Ferguson, Irish linen in Ireland, and their chief scientist, a woman, took one look and she said, aha, French invisible reweaving. And the people in Turin, when this got published, there is no such thing as French invisible reweaving. They're just making this up. And then my friend Thibaut Heimberger, a medical doctor in Paris, goes to a used bookstore and he finds a book and he sends it to me. It's called The Friendway System of French Invisible Reweaving, Preserving a Dying Art Form. So to say it doesn't exist is wrong. And guess where it was perfected? Well, it was perfected at the French court and it was perfected because there were tapestries imaged on both sides. You know, if you get something, if you burn a hole in your trousers today, you can get it rewoven so the outside is perfect. But if you look at the backside, it's messy. Why? Because nobody sees the backside, who cares? But French Invisible were even designed to be perfect on both sides. And guess where the shroud was at the time this technique was perfected in France? In France! What a coincidence, huh? And what better object to do it on, and why? Take a look here. When you cut a piece out, when you cut a piece out of a woven cloth, especially a three over two herringbone weave, it starts to unravel. So you have to reweave it. Well, Benford Marino say, there was nothing wrong with the carbon dating. The only thing wrong was they only took one sample and they took it from a lousy place. Well, I hear this and I'm all excited because this makes sense. I don't need to be a physicist to understand that. That's just a simple answer. So they're presenting their paper and they're showing that, hey, if it's 60, 40, new and old, you're gonna get a date right around 1200. Well, what a coincidence. So I think this is awesome. And I say to Benford Marino, as they come off the stage, I jump up and I say, guys, and they're my friends anyway, I knew them both, but I said, guys, you gotta let me put this on shroud.com. Okay, no problem. I put it on shroud.com. Day or two after I publish it, I get a phone call from Ray Rogers, the chemist at Los Alamos, the guy I had nicknamed the gunfighter during our exam of the, uh, exam of the Shroud and Turin because he wouldn't tolerate anything bad science. He would blast you. 
And Ray, Ray calls me and he says, what kind of stuff are you putting on your website? And I'm changing the words that he used because there are ladies and maybe priests present. Um, and I'm in a church. He says, look, these people aren't scientists. They're the lunatic fringe. They're only using their eyes. They didn't do any chemistry. I said, yeah, you're a chemist. Of course you're going to say that. He says, you know, I have a piece of the shroud sitting in my safe for 25 years. This is going to force me to open up that safe and pull that out. You give me five minutes. I'm going to prove them wrong. I said, go for it, Ray. Those were my exact words. I'll never forget that conversation. About an hour and a half later, Ray Rogers calls me back. He's no longer upset. In fact, he's quite mellow for Ray Rogers. I say, okay, Ray, what's up? He says, well, I don't believe it. What, Ray? I think they're right. Because he started looking. And he found cotton interwoven with a piece, the piece he'd had that had been lifted from an area directly adjacent to where the carbon dating sample had been taken from. So there were fibers that would be in common between the two. He not only finds an end-to-end -end splice, and there's no splicing anywhere else on the shroud. He not only finds that end-to-end -end splice, he finds that this area has been dyed and that the dye was matter root, or, uh, rose matter dye from the matter root plant, a typical organic dye used in medieval times. He said, somebody manipulated it. He said, you know what? I think they're right. And so here's Ray Rogers, this brilliant chemist from Los Alamos National Lab, trying to prove him wrong, winds up proving him right. And so he looks and he finds an end-to-end -end splice in this sample, and believe it or not, this sample's sort of, matter of fact, there, I think there's a better one. Yeah, there's an end-to-end -end splice, splice. You can see two pieces coming together tip to tip. This is out of Roger's work. And this is my photo. Now, the piece Rogers had in his safe came from this triangular white section here. Professor Reyes, R-A-E-S, had cut this out in 1973 and gave Rogers a piece of it in 1979. The carbon dating sample came from to the right of the seam. You see that darker area? That's not a shadow, it's darker there because that's the area that was dyed and over the centuries as the cloth aged, the dyed area aged and discolored differently than the rest of the cloth. And Rogers says to me, you know, when he first got this little piece, and you can see that there would be uh, fibers common to both, he said when he first got it and he put it under his microscope and he saw cotton in it, he said, well, I didn't think it was from the shroud, so I just put it in my safe and didn't do anything with it for 25 years. He says, I never thought that this could be a rewoven section. Well, and by the way, in the UV fluorescence, you see it there too, it's darker there. How about that? So the sample they used came from a very questionable area. And look, this is a chemical map produced by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Pretty trustworthy organization, I would think. This chemical map, there's that white triangle. Now there's a patch to the left. We would expect that to be a different color because it's a different material. But to the right of that patch is a seam. And to the right of the seam, you see it's kind of greenish and then all of a sudden becomes the warmer colors of the rest of the shroud. So I asked John Lohr, the man from JPL who made this, what does this indicate, John? He says, well, it's a chemical map. It doesn't show us what the chemistry is. It just shows us differences in chemistry. So there's a different chemical composition in the section that they used for radiocarbon dating. This is scientific evidence here. This isn't some wishful thinking. So when they did the carbon dating, and this is really hard because I couldn't get it small enough, there's where they took the sample from along that little strip. Only half that sample was used. They cut the strip out, cut it in half, put a half aside, called that the reserve sample. The other half they divided in thirds, gave it to the three labs. That's the only place on the shroud they took any samples from. Now, are there any scientists here? I mean, card-carrying, hardcore scientists in the room? No, not tonight. Because where there is, I always make the following statement that any scientist will tell you, you can never claim a 95% certainty from one test period. 
That's what they did. So Rogers, knowing that the sample that had been in his safe all those years couldn't be used as a basis for any scientific, because it'd be too easy to challenge. Its chain of custody was questionable. So he requests a piece of that reserve sample, and they send it to him. And he goes through it, and he finds all the same stuff. So Rogers, being a smart guy, realizing these are his conclusions, he needs an independent researcher, scholar, to look at this and verify it. So Rogers sends it to a guy named John Brown in Atlanta, Georgia, who's a material scientist. And ladies, you'll really appreciate this. John Brown was this master microscopist. He had 25 microscopes at home, including a scanning electron microscope on the dining room table. I'm sure his wife was thrilled with that because it fills up the whole, I mean, it's a big machine, fills up the whole table. And so Rogers sends it to John Brown to look. Now, Rogers remembered that when something is woven, you have warp fibers crossing the weft fibers. But if you, and, and Rogers determined that the dye had been applied after the reweave. So obviously, if you remove the warp fibers, what would be left would be an undyed area underneath. He sends the stuff to John Brown, and John Brown finds the undyed areas. There they are, plain as day. He even does ultraviolet fluorescence microscopy, and the undyed areas don't fluoresce, the rest of it does. He finds cotton interwoven, forbidden by Jewish law, and nowhere else did we find cotton interwoven on the shroud. Roger said that he found that gum Arabic dye applied to the surface of the fibers with the dye in it, called it uh, an incrustation. John Brown images that beautifully in this micrograph. I told you he had a scanning electron microscope. He made some SEM images. And John Brown independently verifies all of Rogers and Benford and Marino's findings. How about that? So Rogers takes all this, writes it into a paper and submits it and gets it published in Thermochemica Acta. You all read that, don't you? Yeah, yeah sure. We all read that one. That's one of our favorites. He gets it published in this really high-end peer-reviewed journal. And five weeks later, oh, I'm sorry. This is one of the images from that paper. You can see the gum. And inside the gum, you can see these little dots. Those are the dye that had been applied. Unbelievable, huh? These are Roger's conclusions. I'm just going to get right to the bottom one here because we're way past time here. Rogers determines that based on this data, the radiocarbon dating sample that was used is not valid for determining the true age of the Shroud of Turin. And this gets published in the peer-reviewed literature on January 20th, and on March 8th, Rogers dies. God gave him just enough time to finish the work, and I'll be honest with you, he, had already, he was dying of prostate cancer for years. He'd had it for 20-some years. And when Ben from Marino came out with this two years before this, I think that brought, gave him two years more life. It gave him purpose, and he, had to, he was trying to prove him wrong, remember? In the end, he proved him right, and he publishes it. And by the way, that paper I showed you is the first piece of published science in the peer-reviewed literature that challenges the radiocarbon dating of the Shroud of Turin. That was the last photo of Rogers made. I made that when I was visiting him in May of 2004, him sitting at his petrographic microscope. A couple years after Rogers' death, three years later, Benford and Marino get their work published in Chemistry Today, an Italian journal that is highly regarded, highly uh, accepted, credible journal. And a month after that, Benford dies of breast cancer at age 51. Again, God gave, him, gave her just enough time to finish her work and took her. So let me back up here for a second. Well, Rogers dies. I find out from his wife, who was on our team, by the way, also. She was a STIRP team member, a chemist at Los Alamos herself. He left me all his stuff. I have that torque applicator. I have the remaining uh, sticky tape samples. Most of them were used up, but there were still a few and I have these little vials with the pieces that he got from Professor Reyes, that end-to-end -end splice I showed you. 
except that one was missing from the package that she sent me. There was the empty vial, but not the sample. It's another year before I get the contents of Roger's computer. And I'm figuring now, Rogers, what would he do with this? If he gave it to someone to look at, he would have recorded that somewhere in his computer. He was a good hardcore scientist. So I'm looking, I'm looking, and sure enough, being a logical guy and Rogers being logical, I look through his computer, I immediately find that a week before he died, he gave it to a guy named Bob Villarreal at Los Alamos National Laboratory. He's a physicist. Well, you know, it's an atomic weapons lab. You're not supposed to be able to call the lab and say, hey, is Bob there? But I called the lab and put on my most professional voice, said, Robert Villarreal, please. Just a minute. Boom, this guy gets on the phone, so now I'm excited. Tell him who I am, friend of Rogers. Rogers gave you the sample. Do you still have it? He said, well, of course I still have it. I was trying to give it back to his wife, but she was so distraught, when, and this was like two years after Roger's death, that I, I still have it. But I said, well, look, remembering that Rogers picked this guy to give the most important sample he had, I figure the best thing I can do is ask him, hey, would you be willing to continue working with me, continuing the work that you started with Rogers? He said, oh, I'd love to. And he said, not only that, we've got two new instruments that didn't even exist when Rogers was alive. And he puts eight of his guys on this team and they go through it and come up with 100% verification of everything Benford and Marino and Rogers and Brown found. And I think we can trust nine scientists from Los Alamos. I think we can. Oh, let me back up just for a second. Okay, so this happens now. Joe Marino had married Sue Benford during this period, and then she died. Joe Marino had been a Benedictine monk at the St. Louis Priory. So he was formerly a priest until the provincial said to him, you gotta stop with the shroud stuff, which he'd been doing for 25 years already because we we're running short on priests, we need you to do other stuff. Joe Marino says, no, I, I can't. He felt compelled, maybe the hand of God. No, so he left the priesthood to continue his work on the shroud. He works with Sue Benford eventually, they get married, then she dies. They had 10 years together. So he goes through his mourning period, comes after that. He's talking to me about looking through the historical record to see if there's any evidence that people had repaired or done repair work on the shroud. The same time he's calling me, a guy named Ed Pryor calls me. He says, hi, and he tells me he's looking to see the, in the history of the shroud if there's any evidence of repairs. And I'm thinking, wait, they're both doing the same thing. I said to Mr. Pryor, excuse me, because when you talk to a scientist, you can tell. I said, Mr. Pryor, are you a scientist? He goes, well, yeah, but I'm retired. I said, really, and, and, and what did you do? I, well, I was a physicist, really. And I said, where did you work? He says, well, when I retired, I was chief scientist for Langley Research NASA. <laughs> oh, really? He's doing the same thing Joe Marino's doing, and I realize if Marino publishes this stuff, he's a former priest, they're gonna challenge him. But if I put the two guys together that are working together, make them work together, and Pryor's name's on there along with Marino, it's going to carry a lot more weight scientifically. And they come up with an article you can find on shroud.com, 40 pages of evidence showing all kinds of repair work being done on the shroud going back centuries. I put it on shroud.com, not a, not a month later, they call me up and say, we got 19 more pages. So now it's 59 pages, you can find it on shroud.com. There's a whole history of evidence that this re repair work on the shroud, this wasn't something unknown. This was something documented over the centuries. And this is my conclusion. It's real simple. The sample used for radiocarbon dating was only one little piece from one little corner, not one other piece anywhere else on the shroud to be used as a, as a reference. And guess what? That carbon dating is flawed and does not represent the main body of the shroud cloth and should be set aside. It's not valid. I told you they did a restoration. My photo on top, unretouched. The new photo on the bottom, direct from the Archdiocese of Turin, unretouched. Can you see the difference? Plus, it looks sterile now, in my opinion. I'll probably get in trouble for saying that too. 
But I just want you to see. We're way out of time, so I'm going to ask that the lights be brought up. Okay, here we go. A couple of things. First thing I'm going to share with you, what my Jewish mother thought of the shroud. That might seem strange. My Jewish mother was born in Poland, emigrated to America as a seven-year-old child, came to the U.S., got a high school education, not a very sophisticated woman. Well, back about 15 years ago, there was the 40th anniversary of my high school graduation. I went to the reunion in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My Catholic friends in Pittsburgh said, look, while you're here, why don't you do a shroud talk? I said, arrange something. We went to the, they went to the Archdiocese. The Archdiocese of Pittsburgh was wonderful, gave us a beautiful venue, uh, put me on the radio, uh, put me in the bulletins. A bunch of people showed up, kind of like this group. My mother was there, my brother was there, my cousins were there. You know how, you know how that goes. Everybody's there. We have a wonderful time. Everybody's happy. We're driving home. My mother is silent. When a Jewish mother is silent, be afraid. I mean, that's scary. Finally, I couldn't stand the silence anymore. And I turned to her, I said, okay, mother, what do you think? I had no idea what was coming. And she turned to me and she said, well, of course, it's authentic. What? It took me 17 years and I left my DNA on it and you hear one lecture and you're convinced? I mean, I know I'm your son, but I'm not that convincing, am I? She goes, no, it's got nothing to do with that. She said, Barry, I said, what makes you say this? She said, give me that, you know how your moms can get that tone of voice with your kids, that sort of condescending tone of voice. You guys know what I'm talking about. She gives me that tone of voice, Barry. They wouldn't have kept it for 2,000 years if it belonged to anyone else, it wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> I did the same thing you did. I laughed, I thought it was funny, until I thought about it and realized what a profound observation my little Jewish mother had made. That cloth violates two Jewish laws. It's got blood on it, must be buried with the body, and it contains an image forbidden to this day by Jews and Muslims. And my mother, in one fell swoop, just sums the whole thing up in a simple statement of, they wouldn't have kept it for 2,000 years unless it belonged to somebody so important that it was worth the risk to save it. Isn't that amazing? From a little old Jewish lady, may she rest in peace. But she did get to hear me say this on television once, and it made her day. <laughs> Just like it would any mom, I guess. So, I'm going to tell you something that I've come to learn about the shroud, and then I'm going to answer the question I posed at the beginning of the talk. I've come to learn that the shroud cannot answer all our questions, and that the answer to faith is not on a piece of cloth but in the eyes and hearts of those who look upon it. Remember I told you that I was looking for, oh, maybe I didn't tell you, I was looking for God in all the wrong places, did I tell you that? Yes. Yeah, and finally found him when I looked inside, I found God was there all along. And my priest friend told me, he says, yeah, Jesus said that. The kingdom of God is within us. Anyway, so I've come to believe that the shroud is not there to answer our questions. I mean, it can answer some but I believe the shroud is there to make us ask the question. So, what's a nice Jewish boy like me doing so involved with the most important relic of Christianity? It took me a long time to figure it out, but I finally did figure it out. Isn't it funny how God always seems to pick a Jew to be the messenger? <laughs> I'm just a messenger, folks. Thank you.